John the Baptist is a very important figure in our faith and in the New Testament. If you think about it, he is in essence the starting point. The scripture actually says the law and the prophets were until John. And so John is integral in that he is baptizing Jesus Christ in the river and that is significant. Now, the reason I bring this up is there are some important elements to that. For example, for some reason, writers of the 19th and 20th century, later in the 19th, earlier in the 20th, and certainly continuing, it, it seems as though that they sort of make a target of John the Baptist. They use some of the texts we're going to look at this morning and in essence try to discredit John to a certain degree in the sense of saying he didn't have a well-rounded message. Now I think part of that goes to the fact that John the Baptist is an individual who quite honestly just sort of drew the line in the sand. There was no neutral ground with John the Baptist. You either made your decision, you repented of your past, and you stood and accepted Jesus Christ, or you didn't. There is no gray area where John the Baptist is. And I think that's why contemporary theologians have a little trouble with them. They seem to want to negotiate, to compromise, to try to bring everybody in, regardless of just how strong they're willing to accept God's word as without error, his word, period. John the Baptist would be a very intolerant individual if you're going to try to play with scripture. For example, did John the Baptist know about the spirit of God? Some modern theologians would put that into question. But Matthew 3.11 declares, I indeed, this is him speaking, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he, Jesus Christ, that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Funny to me, a man who doesn't know the Holy Spirit is talking about the Holy Spirit. Did John the Baptist know about and acknowledge the Godhead? Matthew 3.16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. By the way, John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And lo, the heavens were opened up unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Mark 1.10, And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. John 1 32 and John that's John the Baptist bear record saying I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it abode upon him by the way you know there are various artist renditions for those of you who haven't made the connection nobody was sitting there with their cell phone camera out snapping pictures of the event so we have artist renderings but a lot of times their artist rendition is based around their particular religion and so you find a lot of pictures that are drawn with Jesus standing and John the Baptist just taking up a seashell with a scoop of water and pouring it over his head. No doctrine for that. No basis for that. He's completely immersed in the water because it's symbolic of the death, burial, and resurrection. So where does that come from? In fact, where does the seashell come from in a muddy river? Add to that, the scriptures say that the Spirit of God descended like a dove. So like a dove would mean there's a calmness, a peace about it. There's a unique application there in understanding better how the Spirit of God works. And yet, not only do the artist renditions have actual doves coming down, I even saw one where he's on the shoulder of Jesus, looks more like a pirate than a savior. So we have to be careful not to let religions or artist renditions shape our theology. Can we be sure that the baptism of Jesus is true? As a matter of fact, we can. 2 Corinthians 13.1 is an establishment of a New Testament principle that was a previously active in the Old Testament. He's basically letting us know it's still the standard. And Paul is writing to the Corinthian church and he says this, this is the third time that I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So, do we have two or three witnesses of the baptism of Jesus Christ? Yes. Remember earlier we said that John bare record, so he's a witness. And, in fact, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And, lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God is there as a witness. 
descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we have the witness of John the Baptist, we have the witness of the Spirit of God, we have the witness of God the Father to the baptism of Jesus, not to mention several thousand people on the hillside watching this event unfold. Not the story, the event. Doesn't start with once upon a time. It starts more like this is the truth. So understand that. So these are true events. And then the passages, the teachings that we're looking at, well, they're often misapplied. The scriptures are accurate. It's the teaching sometimes that gets off course. They do an injustice to John the Baptist. And I explain to you why I feel like that's true. It's because no neutral ground with John. It's God, God's word, or nothing. So the title of the lesson is titled Incomplete Picture, and I think that could easily come from that misapplication of John the Baptist. It's based around Acts 18, 24 through 28, and 19, 1 through 7. To be honest, if I was going to just rename the whole lesson, I'd probably go with name dropping is not the same as being somebody. What I mean by that, I think most of people would be familiar with that expression, name dropping. I can give you an example that, you know, I've had a lot of lunches with our pastor, the senior pastor at our church. Well, actually, to be more precise, I sat at a table where he was speaking at a dinner and he was actually over, well, we never actually talked at those meetings. Uh, another example is, you know, I could tell you, I could do a little name dropping, that I've been to the White House with the president and the Shah of Iran. To be a little more accurate, the church I was at at the time, they needed a friendly audience, so they brought out a group from our church. We were out in the back of the Rose Garden. The main dignitaries were seated in the front, and the president and the Shah were at the very front. I remember them as being little tiny people up front that I could barely see. But technically, I was at the White House, so I could say that. But in reality, do you think we were like having dinner together talking? No. Name dropping is a funny thing, but we need to be careful when we hear somebody name dropping, oh, I know so-and-so, I've been with so-and-so. Make sure we find out if they are really there or just part of the crowd. Because name dropping is not the same thing as actually being somebody. And in this passage, I think John the Baptist is definitely somebody, and people are trying to name drop with him to put themselves in the picture. Speaking of an incomplete picture, we're going to first encounter some folks that have more passion than performance. It's an individual, actually, that we're going to read about. And he does have a lot of talent and skill, but he doesn't have that whole picture. Acts 18, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria. Alexandria, by the way, was sort of the hub of learning at the time. Uh, tremendous literature, tremendous uh, people who studied and applied. And Apollos was a tremendous speaker. The scripture continues, And an eloquent man, that good speaking I spoke of, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. And so here's this very eloquent man who could always draw the crowd. Verse 25, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Now, that's one of the places our contemporary theologians will jump in and try to say, well, you see, he was a limited message. It really didn't have the full gospel in there of everything we need to know. That's a bit challenging. Let's think for a moment, what does it mean to say only the baptism of John? Well, we've already talked about in those scriptures that John spoke of repent, meaning to turn your life around and come to Jesus Christ. He understood, in essence, the plan of salvation. He spoke that the kingdom is nigh, meaning he is anticipating Christ to come, and he's anticipating that there is a future millennial reign. He's anticipating the coming Messiah. He also acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. It's starting to sound like a pretty rounded message. And finally, he definitely confirms that there is a trinity. After all, he's standing there during the baptism with Jesus in front of him. He has the Spirit of God descend, and he hears the voice of God from the heavens. And you'll recall back into our history that John's mother 
uh, Elizabeth was a cousin to Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ. And they had met, they knew each other. In fact, he was one of the first testimonies, if you will, because when Mary and Elizabeth, while they were pregnant, both met, that it says in the scripture that John leapt within the womb at the presence of his Savior. So yes, the message of John the Baptist is pretty complete. There may be some things we can touch on, but remember, there's more than water to John the Baptist's message. That's important to understand. So what about Aquila and Priscilla? Those are two names we're about to find out about in the scripture. Priscilla, by the way, is sort of interesting. Her proper name is Prisca. Priscilla is a more intimate, friendly kind of name. So when we speak of Aquila and Priscilla, we're speaking of husband and wife. We're talking about two people very strong in their faith, good teachers. And interestingly that we use that warmth name of Priscilla, she's from other scriptures and from history documents. We find that she was a very warm and kind person. And she was very tender hearted, reaching out to people. Both of these people had a powerful stance in the gospel. In fact, in other places we find that they ministered with Paul. When Paul went on the journey, Paul goes into a church and it's a very difficult time. They're there, they're ministering, they're working and helping. In fact, it's particularly interesting, there's actually a Roman piece of literature where a Roman leader is sending out an edict to have them removed from the town to get them out of the city. He accuses them of an interesting charge. He says of Aquila and Priscilla that they talk too much about Christ. They won't stop talking about him. And so basically they're being expelled from the city because they won't shut up about Jesus. Let me ask you, are there anybody here under a current, you know, outstanding warrant because you won't stop talking about your faith? That is something to be charged with. I think wouldn't be such a bad thing. Now, I bring them up because they are two people who have more passion than obstacles. I don't mean that they didn't have things to deal with. I'm just saying they didn't let things become an obstacle. You pass an order that says you can't witness, those two people are going to be breaking those orders. You tell them they can't go someplace and God sends them, they go. They don't acknowledge an obstacle. We see that in 26 and 28. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Who? Apollos, the one we just spoke about that was, you know, very focused but only knew about John's baptism. And when that happened, whom, when Aquila and Priscilla, who were there, heard this, well, they took him unto them, and they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. We see a great way of testimony for operating, for teaching, for loving another brother or sister in Christ in the role of Aquila and Priscilla. They took him unto them, first of all, privately. They took him aside. Their goal was not to embarrass them and say, oh, we know this, you don't know this. They didn't stand up in the meeting and say, hey, hey, yeah, you're wrong. No, he was accurate, and he was quite the speaker, very intellectual. But they take him aside privately, and then what we find is that with organization, with detail, they go in a more excellent way. You know, it's interesting when you study Scripture privately, you find what's referred to as the two hands of Scripture. If you think about the hand, that you have five, uh, you know, four fingers and a thumb on one hand, and than the other. And so there are 10 broad areas of study in scripture, two sections, five and five. And so there's a methodology as you approach studying God. That is what theology is. It's the scientific methodical approach to studying God. And so they were very methodical in presenting the greater truths of the scripture to Apollos. And Apollos, to his credit, was open and ready to receive this teaching. And so as a result of that, he is now going out and he's teaching with greater strength, greater passion, and a greater uh, expansion. He still had all the message of John the Baptist, which was very complete, but now he's talking in greater detail about what it means to be a Christian. How do you walk in your faith? He's got more detail about our uh, requirements to come together. Maybe requirements is not the best word. Maybe the drive, the passion to come together and honor Christ as we worship, as we uh, share the gospel, things of this nature. So Acts 18, verse 27, And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote. Why would they write anything about him unless he has matured in his faith because of that meeting? He, they write exhorting the disciples that he's about to travel to to receive him, who, when he was come, this is interesting, 
he helped them much and had believed which through grace. So when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. In other words, the Gentiles. They didn't have the benefit of the Old Testament law where they had studied and learned and knew that history. They encountered Christ and accepted him as Lord and Savior. But they're starting their faith on ground one. And so he comes and he teaches them about the grace of God, drawing from the training and the learning that he had, and much of which we can attribute to Aquila and Priscilla. And then we also see in verse 28, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So to the Jews of the day that were there, he presents the gospel. He presents it from the scriptures. And so in other words, he's quoting the Old Testament and showing that Christ is the fulfillment and so that they can have a confidence and a peace about it. Yes, he is the Messiah. He is the answer to the prophecies of the Old Testament. So we begin with this incomplete picture such as it was with a man who has more passion than performance. He is a great speaker, but he didn't have the whole truth. Now he's got the truth. Why? Because of two people who had more passion than obstacles. They didn't see barriers to moving forward and where God would lead. And then finally, we look at a couple of individuals who have more passion than engagement. These are the people who are like the ultimate name droppers because they really don't know what they don't know. Acts 19, 1 through 7. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, remember he got those letters and he went out and he began touching the lives of the Gentiles, clarifying their questions, and also reaching out to the Jews who now understood Jesus is Messiah. Paul then, having passed through the upper coast, well, he comes to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So these are people who identify themselves as being disciples. Well, he says unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And their reaction, well, they said unto him, we've not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. These people were acluistic. If you're not familiar with that term, it means they didn't have a clue. They didn't understand. Now, they claimed to be disciples on one hand, but they didn't know who the Holy Spirit was. Remember John? He was acquainted with the Holy Spirit. He understood this. That's important. Why? Acts 19, verse 3. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. That's a great red flag to the Apostle Paul, because he knows that no, John's testimony is that he would have spoken about that. They would have been aware, but they weren't. And so they only knew the baptism of John, as we already said. That means repentance. That means the kingdom is nigh. Jesus is Messiah. There's a trinity. How can you be preaching and saved under the message of a man who preaches trinity when they don't even know who the Holy Spirit is? That's bizarre. So let's think then about Paul's next statement. And remember, what is the plan of salvation? Paul says in verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, if that's not the plan of salvation, what is? There's repentance, acknowledging your sin, accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is the gospel. Verse 5, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let's talk about baptism for a moment, by the way. Think of it like this. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God comes upon a person for a special act of service. The Spirit of God does not indwell people long term in the Old Testament. That's why David was able to pray a prayer that you and I should not pray. He prayed, God, remove not your Holy Spirit from me. Because he wanted to be used of God. He did not want the Spirit of God to be taken away. He wanted to have the power of God in his life in that unique way. New Testament age that you and I live in today. The Spirit of God indwells us at the very moment of salvation. And we know him. And he teaches us. He secures us in our salvation so we can't lose our faith. When we're reading something, he teaches us more. Interesting, by the way, if you test the scriptures... Uh, and what they call the flesh kincaid writing. Uh, it's in other words, the readability test. You can check most of scripture and it's up at around the eighth grade reading level. You look at those scripture verses that speak of the plan of salvation. 
like John 3.16 or Romans 10.9 and 10. And what's interesting, those are at the fourth grade reading level or a little less, maybe between third and fourth grade. It's like God, when he gave us his word, took the plan of salvation, what you needed to get saved and to know our need of salvation, put it down there on the bottom shelf where any child could get to it. And then he took the deeper things of God and put it up higher on the shelf. And that's okay too, because not only will you have the, the strength of being a part of a local church and godly teachers and godly pastors, but the very spirit of God indwelling you, opening up his word to you so you'll understand it better. That's a blessing in and of itself. When they heard this, the truth of the gospel, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So either they were taught by a different John, not John the Baptist, because John would have given them the whole story, the truth. Or they made an impulsive decision they never were saved. They just ran up with the crowd and ran back and never understood what they had a hold of. That's pretty sad. Because if they weren't saved and they thought they were, they were in trouble. So, verse 6, And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now that's significant. Why? Because that is fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. Joel 2.28 And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. You see, in the Old Testament there's different places where we have an understanding of what will happen when the Spirit of God comes and he will be coming and indwelling on that permanent basis because of the fact that Messiah has come. There's been a change. So Old Testament, the Spirit of God comes upon people for a special act of service. New Testament day in which you and I live, he indwells us, he secures our salvation, can't lose it. He teaches us so we'll understand God's word better and he guides us, he gives us direction with incredible wisdom that transitional period when they received the Spirit of God. Some of these folks were already saved through Christ's ministry and others. And now the Spirit of God comes and indwells him. And when they do, suddenly they, they'll speak forth in a known language. They'll speak in what they call tongues. Interesting, by the way, when it happened at Antioch, or rather correction, when it happened at Pentecost, what was interesting, they're in a seafaring town. There's all these other languages spoken because all the people who travel to do commerce there and if you look at the number of people who spoke, speaking in a known language that they didn't know, but it was a known established language, and you look at the groups that are mentioned, you have the same number of groups as you have of disciples who are speaking. In other words, each of those 12 people, each one of them actually spoke in a language that the crowd can understand. That's why they say, but you know, you are unlearned men. In other words, how is it you know these different languages? It's the Spirit of God. And in this passage, they're doing the same thing again. And why are they doing these things? Because fulfillment of prophecy lets people know something has changed. Messiah has come. We have a faith in Jesus Christ that is unique, that has been promised for years. The Spirit of God is now going to be indwelling in a way that is new to an Old Testament saint and something that we enjoy and are blessed with to this day. We don't need to do these particular items. We, God certainly does some miraculous things today, but we don't need to speak in tongues. We don't have to have these special visions because those were the fulfilling of prophecy that Christ has come and he has come and the spirit is indwelling. He is indwelling. For now it's happened, but for those people, it was a big red flag that went up and said, things have changed. The spirit of God is here. Jesus the Christ is Jesus the Christ. Acts 19 verse 7 and all the men were about 12. By the way, that's 12 men, not 12 years old. 12 men who said they were disciples, thought they were of John's, and we find out, no, wrong answer. They needed to know Jesus Christ as Savior. Now that's a powerful lesson for you and me as believers because we need to understand that claiming anything but Christ is not salvation. You can share the gospel with somebody. You can talk to them. A lot of times we ask something as basic as, has there ever been a time in your life when you accepted Jesus Christ? And sometimes you'll get an answer, yes. And other times you get an answer, many times. You know, Hey, like Paul, you had that little red flag off in your head and said, no, not many times. And you ask more questions and you keep asking questions until you hear the truth of the right answer. When witnessing, ask the right question 
till you get the right answer. What he found out is he was pretty well confident they were not saved, and so he immediately followed with the plan of salvation. You ask a question of somebody, you get an answer that tells you or makes you wonder, are they saved? Why not follow with something like, can I share with you what happened when I got saved? Most people will listen. And share that short little testimony, maybe about a minute's worth, of what happened in your life when you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And then that person who said they were saved a moment ago, ask them, how about you? What was it like? Have you ever accepted Christ in that way? And if they then understand you better and clarify and they talk of it with a passion and an understanding, you realize, hey, I have a brother or sister in Christ here. Or if not, ask him, would you like to? Because you see, really what the scripture tells us, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, if we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is the plan of salvation. And by the way, you can't lose your salvation because the Word of God says, not my opinion, the Word of God, that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, or powers, nor things present, my favorite part, or things to come, even things we haven't found out yet, nothing can separate us from the love of God. So don't ever feel defeated. Don't ever fail to witness. Don't ever feel like, I just don't have the words. Just go back to basics. Has there ever been a time? Listen to the answer and follow up with the truth of God, knowing he is faithful. By the way, I would like you to like, comment, and share, and subscribe to this channel so we can continue this study, continue this dialogue. When you subscribe to that channel and click that you'd like to be notified, what happens is you'll be notified when we post another video. And we can continue this talk, this conversation together. And by the way, I want you to know that through Jesus Christ, you can succeed. Thank you, and God bless you.